This meeting is now being recorded. So um, I'm going to try to engage you, and I'm hoping that uh, that would work uh, today. So the Center for Excellence in Primary Care, over the last five years, we've done about 50 uh, visits to primary care practices all around the country. And many of them are what we call high-performing primary care practices or kind of bright spots, practices that we can learn a lot from. And, and from looking at these, these bright spot practices, what we found is that many of them have the same features, and we've taken those features and we've put them together into what we call the building blocks of high-performing primary care. We're not going to talk about the building blocks today because that's a whole different discussion, um, but the building block that we are going to talk about today is population management. So first I want to just give a sort of general overview of how we view population management, and then we're going to, we're going to take a deeper dive into the part of population management that is um, care for patients with complex health care needs. Somebody needs to move their phone. Yeah. up to my ear. What is it? So if you look at population management, you can stratify your population. The population could be everyone who comes to your practice or clinic, or it could um, be everyone who is um, impaneled to you as a provider or as a team. So if you look at the whole population, everyone in the population needs certain um, what we call panel management, which is making sure that they have all their chronic and preventive care uh, sort of routine needs met. So making sure that everyone has cancer screening, that everyone with diabetes has all of the different lab tests that they need on a regular basis. So panel management is the part of population management, which is for every single person in your population. Then we get to a smaller part of your population, which is people with one or two chronic conditions. Someone with diabetes or diabetes and hypertension or diabetes and hypertension and depression. So not very complex chronic diseases, but chronic diseases. And that part of your, your population really needs health coaching, and we're going to talk quite a bit about health coaching in a few minutes. And then we get to a smaller part of your population which is people with multiple uh, chronic diseases, many diagnoses, um, and who use the healthcare system a lot, which is what we're going to talk about for a lot of the time in this um, discussion. So this is kind of looking at population management overall and the different sort of ways that one can stratify your population. So let's talk a little bit about these two terms, which are care coordination and care management. And after we talk about that, I'm going to ask you all some questions. So there's a lot of confusion about the difference between these two terms. So the way that um, I think a lot of people are in increasingly beginning to um, define these terms is that care coordination is really making sure that everyone in a primary care practice, that, they're, they're, that the primary care practice is coordinating their care with the other facilities and institutions and personnel in the medical neighborhood. And of course, the medical neighborhood is this term of like if the primary care practice is a medical home, the medical neighborhood is the neighborhood around the medical home. And what we found is that care coordination is not very good. There are a lot of problems with with primary care practice related to specialists, the hospitals, and so forth. So care coordination is to make sure that there's a seamless coordination of people's care no matter where they're getting the care. And that's really the responsibility of the primary care practice. So that's care coordination. Care management is more of a, of a clinical um, function. It's assisting people patients and families to live with their chronic conditions through patient education, health coaching, medication management. So care management is much more clinical. 
care coordination is a, a way more of organizational, navigational, making sure that people get where they need to be, um, whereas care management is a much more clinical enterprise. I think a lot of you are, are care managers, I think, um, who do care management. A complex care management is really team-based care management for people who have complex um, illnesses to improve their health and to reduce the need for expensive services. So care coordination is part of complex care management, which is making sure people can navigate the confusing healthcare system. But care management is actually more than care coordination. Care coordination is more the navigation part. So this is the confusing healthcare system. <laughs> if, you look at, if you look at the um, primary care practice in the center of the healthcare system, the primary care practice has to interact with all of these different other entities, which also interact with each other. So it's really, really confusing to actually for a patient to try to figure out how to to get what they need from all of these different entities. And it's really the responsibility of the primary care practice to make that happen. So that's really care coordination that we're talking about here. So now I want to go over some of the um, differences between care coordination or care management. I'm going to ask you all, uh, I assume that your phones are unmuted at the moment. Is that correct? So I'd like you all just to Speak up. I don't care if you're all talking at once. I want to ask you about each of these things. So, is this care coordination or care management? This is just making sure we understand these two terms. So, a referral coordinator in a primary care practice checks for the health plan to see if the health plan has approved the CT scan for a patient. Is that care coordination or is that care management? Everyone just say what they think. Coordination. Coordination. Anyone else? More people? Care coordination or care management? Care coordination. That's what this, this is definitely care coordination. This is not a clinical thing. This is just to make sure that uh, people can, um, that the relationship between um, the health plan and the primary care practice is working. Okay, let's do number two. A social worker has a discussion with a high utilizing patient about alternatives to calling 911. Is that care coordination or care management? Management. Care management. Absolutely. So this, this is really like, this is not just helping people um, to navigate the system. This is like many people, especially people on Medicaid, many people go to the emergency room because really they don't understand what else to do if they feel sick but to call 911. So this is really like helping them to be self-managers. And I know at San Francisco General, which is where I work, we have a lot of people who just call 911 when they get into trouble. And so we have care managers who really make sure that people understand what else they could do when they get sick. Okay, good job, everybody. Spanish-speaking medical assistant goes to a specialist visit with a Latino patient to translate. Management or care coordination? Care coordination. Care coordination. Good. Okay, that, that is like making sure that people can navigate the healthcare system outside of the primary care practice in a way that works for them. Okay, fourth one. RN discusses alternatives to using opioids for a chronic pain patient and offers substance use referral. Care coordination or care management? Care management. Care management. Care management. Okay, all of you are, everything, everyone's correct so far. So this is really a much more clinical, like really um, working with a patient in terms of their, a big clinical problem, and it's a clinical problem that often is present in high utilizing uh, patients. Okay, medical assistant uses a referral log to contact specialists who have not returned consultation reports to see if the patient attended the appointment and to get the report. Care management for care coordination. Coordination. Care coordination. coordination. Care coordination. Absolutely. Thank you. Finally, a medical assistant health coach engages a patient to discuss medication adherence. Care coordination or care management? Care coordination. 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 Care co
Coordination. Your management. Your management. Management. Yeah, I figured that there'd be some difference of opinion on this one. I would definitely call this care management. This is really helping people to self-manage their chronic disease. It's more clinically oriented. And I think what maybe threw you off is um, the medical assistance. So I think I said earlier, generally speaking, care management is done by licensed personnel, by nurses, pharmacists, social workers, um, physical therapists, uh, um, health educators, and so forth. Whereas this is an unlicensed person, the medical assistant. But as you'll see in a few minutes when we talk about health coaching, medical assistants can be very effective health coaches, generally working with a team, usually supervised by a nurse or social worker or, or someone else who, who is licensed. So their management teams um, will include non-licensed people. So in this case, I would call this care management. Okay. So much for that. So from now on, we're going to be pretty much talking about care management. And I'm going to start out with care management with for not such complex patients because it's really – a lot of the principles of care management uh, apply both to complex and to non-complex patients. So if you look at some research, this was a, there's a systematic review done, um, 41 studies of patients with diabetes, and they did planned visits with a nurse care manager, and this was associated with improved outcomes. Now, planned visits is a really important um, uh, part of care management and care of people with complex illnesses. Because if you look at the, if someone sort of comes in to a physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant visit, the average visit takes about 19 to 20 minutes. That's based on um, national data. How many of you, I'd like people just to call out if they'd like to, what do you think the number of problems that get dealt with on average, in the 20-minute visit? Uh, five. 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 No. Anyone think it's three? One or two. Six. One or two? Well, actually, if you look at the data, the average visit, there are 7.1 problems that either the patient or the provider wants to deal with. Of course, that's totally absurd. There's no way you can do 7.1 uh, deal with 7.1 issues in a 20-minute visit, it's, it's impossible. So the idea of having a planned visit um, is this is a visit which, that just deals with the patient's chronic disease or chronic diseases. Now, usually if that visit's with a provider, all the other things will come up. So generally that visit is with a, a care manager who's often a nurse care manager, um, who could really spend some time working on um, the patient's uh, chronic illness. Now, then the question is, what happens in the planned visit that really works to improve outcomes? And it's interesting that the two key things are health coaching, which is really another word for self-management support. Um, and then the other thing that really works well is when the RN or pharmacist using standing orders can make medication adjustments without awaiting physician authorization. So the, the, the person in the planned visit can increase the metformin dose for someone with diabetes or increase um, you want this? the dose of a patient for a patient with high blood pressure. So I'm wondering, do any of you in your practices, those of you who are in primary care practices, do any of you have standing orders that allow an RN or a pharmacist to actually change medication doses? Yes. Yeah. No. Can you a few minutes? I've just no. a little bit about it. No. No. So someone said that they do do that. Can you say a, a, just a little bit about it? For example, Coumadin management. Uh, we have a protocol that the nurses can adjust the dosing of Coumadin based on the INR. Great. That's, that's one example I think is fairly common. Uh, does anyone have a situation where an RN or a pharmacist can increase doses of diabetes or hypertensive medication? Oh, yes. Mercy Health. And, and, and is it a, far, a RN or a pharmacist or both? It's um, both. 
Excellent. So I know it varies a lot from one state to another. In, in California, we have the, the nursing board uh, allows nurses under standardized procedures, which is pretty much the same as standing orders, which have to be approved by the physicians um, in the practice. But the standardized procedures actually allow RNs to make medication adjustments. That seems to be a really helpful thing so that the planned visit is not only patient education or health coaching, it actually is medication management. Okay, let's move on. Um, So we're going to talk about health coaching a little bit because health coaching really is a key part of um, care management for both complex patients and patients with one or two chronic diseases. So what is health coaching? So because I'm a doctor, I can save it. Doctors often tell their patients what to do and then call them non-compliant if they don't do it. Unfortunately, that happens. A lot. Even more, unfortunately, sometimes nurses do that, though really it's more of a, of a, a doctor disease. There, uh, health coaching is really a paradigm shift in which you engage, engage patients to learn their goals so that we learn their goals, find out what they're willing and able to do, and we meet them halfway. So there's no such thing as non-compliant because of, that the patients set their goals. Now, their goals may be different than our goals. Our goal may be a hemoglobin A1C of 7 or a BMI of 22. Their goals may be quite different. They're may, they're, maybe their key goal is to um, really have a reasonable, non-stressful life. And they may want to compromise. And maybe they're satisfied with a hemoglobin A1C of 8.5. So one has to work with the patient to see what's possible. It's a very different way of working um, than the, the more typical way, which is the evidence says that we should do such and such, so we want to make the patient do that. Well, they probably won't do it if they don't want to do it. So what health coaching does is it assists patients to gain the knowledge, skills, and confidence to become informed, active participants in managing their chronic conditions. I think a lot of us believe in knowledge, health education, Patient education is really important, and it is. But if you look at the studies, um, solely doing patient education helps people to know more about their disease, but it doesn't change their outcome. So if you look at a patient with diabetes, you do traditional patient education, you give them a test, they'll do much better. But their A1Cs do not improve compared to people who didn't get that education. People need more than education. They need skills. And a skill for a patient with diabetes, for example, is not only to check your blood sugars, but to know what the number is and to know what to do about it, if it's high or if it's low. Those are the patients that do better. Then they also need confidence, because we know that people, if they're confident, they can probably do something, and if they're not confident, they probably can't. So again, going back to care management, the key components are health coaching and medication management. And health coaching, you know, all of us should do health coaching. Physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, everybody should do health coaching. But we also believe that sometimes there's not time for everyone to do health coaching, so it's nice to have a few people who are just health coaches and who can do health coaching full time. Is there evidence that health coaching works? Well, these are two randomized trials that we did at the University of California in San Francisco. There are, there's other evidence also. We took medical assistants, we trained them to be health coaches, and they were health coaches for patients with diabetes, hypertension, and or hyperlipidemia. And compared to patients who didn't have health coaches, the, the patients that had health coaches had significant improvement in their A1C and LDL cholesterol. Now we've actually looked a year after the coaching stopped. So they were coached for a year, then no coaching for a year, and we looked at their A1Cs again, and they were still better than the control group. So the coaching really works and it lasts. We also did a, a trial of low-income patients with poorly controlled diabetes being coaches. These we call them peer health coaches. 
and they coach other patients with diabetes, and those other patients had significantly improved A1C levels compared to people who didn't have a peer health coach. So part of health coaching, and again, this is so critical for complex care management. I think a lot of people who talk about complex care management don't really talk about the health management support or health coaching that's a real critical part of it. So if you look at our website at CEPC, which is Center for Excellence in Primary Care, .ucsf.edu, there are lots and lots of health coaching um, materials, including some videos that show what is good health coaching and what is not such good health coaching. And we have several different sort of techniques that are part of health coaching. One of them is ask, tell, ask, which is comes to motivational interviewing and making sure that people are able to you know, constantly asking people questions rather than talking, talking, talking. And I feel like right now I'm talking, 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 so I'm not doing ask, tell, ask, but it's kind of difficult to do on a webinar. But if you're talking to a patient, most of the time they should be talking and you should be talking just a little bit. And what happens is that they do better if they're engaged in a conversation like that where they really can say what they think, say how they react to different things. This is a really interesting one. Know your numbers. This is a study in which they compared patients who knew what their hemoglobin A1C was and, and what their hemoglobin A1C goal was. And they compared it to people who didn't know. Um, and people who know their A1C and their A1C goal have better control of their diabetes than people who don't know. So let me ask a question to, to people who might want to say, and also if you want to, you know, answer any of these questions by sending a chat message, please do that. That would be great. In general, do you feel like the patients with diabetes that you work with know what their A1C is and know what their A1C goal is? Anyone want to say anything about what, what do you think about that? Um, yes. They know those things. Okay. And anyone feel like they don't know them? A lot of the patients don't know their A1C and their A1C goal? I think what I've found is, I would go say ahead. There probably are a lot of patients that don't know that, but the ones that we see that we're working with, we have, a, they know it. I think that's the difference. Because of you. Yeah, that's because they have you to deal with. It, right? That's right. <laughs> so you teach it to them. So that's what we teach. We really teach people in our health coaching to make sure they really know their A1C and their goal, to know what their blood pressure is and their blood pressure goal, to know what their LDL cholesterol is. And now, of course, there's a lot of debate whether there should be an LDL goal, but I think that patients like having an LDL goal. Next thing we do in health coach treatment is closing the loops. And this is absolutely critical because the terrible thing is that 50% of people leave the medical office visit without understanding what happened in the visit. Awful. So closing the loop or teach back is asking people to say back what their care plan is. So for example, if a, if a provider is saying, okay, I'd like to increase your metformin from 500 milligrams one in the morning, one at night, to 500 milligrams two in the morning and two at night, and then remember, 50% of people will probably go home and won't remember what it was. If you ask people, just to be sure I was clear, how are you going to be taking your metformin starting tomorrow, and the patient can say it back correctly, there's a much better chance that they will actually take their metformin. And the research shows that if you ask people to say it back, um, they're, if they're diabetic patients, their A1Cs are better if you ask people to, to close the loop to, to say back what it is that you ask them to do. Uh, next thing that we do in health coaching is uh, counseling people with medication adherence, which is very effective because medication adherence, of course, is a huge issue in chronic disease. And then finally, we spend a lot of time on action plans. So action plans are agreements between a health coach and a patient. And it doesn't have to, it could be anybody. I mean, it doesn't have to be a health coach. It could be whoever the person is that's talking to the patient about their chronic disease. 
specifying a behavior change that the patient has chosen to make. And there was also a very nice randomized controlled trial in which they compared patients who had traditional patient education to patients who were engaged in setting goals and making action plans. And the people who set goals and made action plans had better A1C than the people with, who did, had traditional patient education whose A1C did not change. So we um, do a lot of work with people to do action plans. We ask people, like, what would you like to work on? If we, again, diabetes is kind of a nice example, but it could be high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, COPD, whatever it may be. What would you like to work on? Well, would you like to work on physical activity, um, um, eating better, taking your medications, let the patient choose what they want to work on, and then make a very specific sort of um, action plan, which would be, okay, you want to work on your your um, healthy eating. Uh, what do you think you eat that makes your A1C go up so high? Well, I eat a lot of ice cream. What would you like to do about your ice cream? Well, I'd like to stop eating ice cream altogether. Well, on a zero to ten scale, how sure are you you can do that? Well, actually, I can't do it. So is there anything you could do that you're more sure you could succeed at? Oh, well, I could maybe eat half a pint of ice cream instead of a whole pint every night. Okay, and how sure you can do that? Well, that's like 9 out of 10. Okay, let's make that your action plan. When do you want to start? I'll start tonight. Can I call you in a, a week to see how you're doing? That's what we do with our action plan, whether it be with physical activity, medication adherence, or something else that's bothering them. Um, so do any of you do that kind of action plan discussions with patients? Yes. 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 And how does, does it work well? Yes. Yes. Now, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes people are not so motivated. Sometimes people will agree on an action plan, but then you call them up and they weren't able to do it. But overall, it seems to work better. And I know what, when I was a physician for so many years, I used to, I didn't know what to do with behavior change. No one really taught me. So I would like beg people or I'd threaten people or I'd scare people or I'd do anything. And action plans in a way, not only do they work better for patients, but they work better for the, for the providers and the team because you feel like, okay, I've worked with the patient, I've let the patient decide what they feel like they can do. Now it's really up to the patient. I've done my best. Now it's the patient's turn um, to step up to the plate and make the changes. So we really like action plans a lot. And of course, Kate Lorick, who really started the whole health coaching enterprise, uh, says if you're confident you can do something, you probably can do it. If you're not confident, you probably can't. Okay. We've now talked about health coaching. Now we're going to really get involved with the issue of um, care for complex, high-utilizing patients, which is supposed to be the main point of this um, webinar. But let me just say health coaching is a crucial part of that also. So I'm sure you all know that average per capita spending goes way, way up as the number of chronic conditions increases. And this is a very old uh, slide, and I really haven't found really good data to update it. But I'm sure it's the same. You just have to double the numbers or triple them. But if you have no chronic conditions, you don't spend a lot of healthcare money. And if you have five plus chronic conditions, you spend a huge amount of healthcare money. Um, and I, I just every time I see this um, these bar graphs, I'm just amazed. And the top one percent of healthcare sp uh, of um, healthcare spenders in the country spend 22% of the total $3 trillion healthcare bill. Amazing. 1% of people incur 22% of all the money that we spend on healthcare in the United States. And 5% spend a half of it. So that's why there's, of course, so much interest in doing something about this 1% or 5% of patients who incur so much of our healthcare costs. So, complex care management. Is care management for patients with complex health care needs? And the goals are reducing total costs of the patient and improving health and the quality of life. 
Now, some people might say, well, really, we're trying to help the patients get better. Costs are important for society, but really our role as caregivers and as healthcare um, professionals, our goal is to make their life better. Well, it turns out that these goals really are virtually the same because if someone is hospitalized a lot, if someone's going to the emergency department a lot, that means that their outcomes are they're not doing well. It also means that they're spending their life in the healthcare system rather than spending their life doing something which is a lot more enjoyable. Most people don't really enjoy spending time in the healthcare system. So really, reducing total costs by reducing hospitalizations, ED visits, um, unnecessary care that they might be getting, that improves their health and their quality of life also. And also, if you improve their outcome, they don't have to go to the hospital as much. So these goals are really very interrelated. So the cost goal is actually also a quality goal. So who does complex care management? Generally speaking, um, it's done with a team, um, team of RN, social worker, pharmacist, and a health coach slash patient navigator. Now that's the ideal situation. I'm wondering if any of you have a complex care management team and if you do, like, who is your team? Who's on your team? Would anyone say that who, who has such a team? Well, we have um, at Mercy Health. We have hybrid yes. case managers. And okay. um, we are uh, centered in the medical home. And we collaborate as a team, within the team, within the neighborhood, um, to care coordinate. And it um, it's working out exceptionally well. And is the team um, who who leads the team? Is it the RN who leads the team? Um, yeah, our care manager um, leads the team. But we do a lot of interactive play, if you will, sharing information. As a matter of fact, we have um, just been granted permission to have the time. Um, away from our settings to um, do some team, team be building, excuse my, tripping over my tongue here, um, team building, um, formally. So um, I give kudos, of course, to our managers who recognize that, you know, not only are we sitting out here in the offices, but it is good to get together uh, so that we can get some sense of what's happening generically. Um, or exceptionally throughout uh, the health system here at Mercy. Great. Does anyone have teams in which the social worker plays a prominent role? We are working on advanced medical home um, models right now, which include a behavioral health uh, specialist who is a social worker and the RN and pharmacist as well. Great. That's kind Excellent. of new for us, but we're working at it. And Good. at this, Mercy you know, as well. For a lot of people. Yes, go ahead. At Mercy as well, the inpatient setting um, is a collaboration between RN and social workers. Um, as a matter of fact, our uh, uh, director, if you will, is a social worker. So she Great. directs That's all of care management. Good. So in general, people caseloads for people who have a complex care management team. If it's an RN or a social worker alone uh, doing the care management, usually one can deal with about 50 complex patients. Um, and if you have an RN plus a social worker plus a health coach or patient navigator, you can perhaps deal with about 200. And it's really interesting that if you have a, an unlicensed person who's trained as a health coach slash patient navigator, they can really help a lot to allow the RN, the social worker, to only deal with the things that their skill is needed for. But a lot of the things that people with complex care management need is just help with relatively simple things. Um, um, and if you have a, a, an unlicensed person working with you, it, it allows you to increase your caseload a lot. The problem right. with these small caseloads is it's very difficult to graduate patients from complex care management because they, they even though they, some of them get better, a lot of them just don't get better and they just stay in your in your complex care management um, panel forever. 
And also, if you tell them, well, you're getting better and maybe you don't need me anymore, they'll say, no, I want you. I want to stay with you. So it's very difficult to, to graduate people from these complex care management um, panels. I used to so work on the East Coast. Oh, go ahead. I used to work on the East Coast um, and had care. I was a care manager within the insurance arena. And our teams were just like uh, what you're talking about. They were the paraprofessional and then the two professionals, social work and, and clinical, working together. And you're right. You are absolutely right. That's the best meld um, to meet the patient's needs across the board. Um, you know, those things that may be medical and clinical and those things that may be just navigating the healthcare system and recognizing what what is out there uh, for, for, from a resource perspective. Um, uh, I found uh, it uh, what fascinating. You, what you just said is, what is one of the most important things that's been said this morning. Thank you for saying that. You're welcome. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about who are the patients to target, what does the team do, and what are some models of, of complex care management. So, it's just incredible how much time people spend on figuring out which patients to target for complex care management. And there's big debate all the time about it. Um, I don't think it's that much of a rocket science, actually. Clearly, it's people with multiple chronic conditions, many medications, uh, frequent hospitalizations, limitations of their activities of daily living. The reason that we worry about it is the complex care management is intensive. You have these very small caseloads for, for highly skilled um, care managers. So you want to make sure that you're targeting the right people. So you don't want people who are too healthy, but you also don't want people who are so sick that they're not going to benefit from it. And, you know, there are all of these sort of – I'm sure that the health plans um, in Michigan, just as they do in California – make these high-risk lists of people whom they want to have complex care management. But sometimes it's people with two or more hospital admits in the past year, or they have these, their different risk scores, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, number of diagnoses, number of um, prescriptions. But a really important one is depression and whether people have self-management skills. I don't know, some of you might use the, the PAM um, the patient activation measure to, to kind of give a sense of whether they have self-management skills to help figure out whether they need this. But social isolation is a really also a very, very major issue in terms of um, people really needing complex care management. So the so health plans will often give you these lists of people that they, they want should be in complex care management but you really have to talk to the primary care physician and the team to see whether that list makes any sense. So you need both the lists of, uh, of these risk scores, but you also need the opinion of the team. And what happens is that they're often very different. So some people will, the team will say, no, 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 that patient, they're not gonna get any better anyway. Or that patient, really, they're better already, so they really shouldn't be on this list, and so forth. So you need both at the high-risk list and the, and the team. Then the other thing is that you have to make sure that the patient and the family is, agrees to engage in complex care management because it's much more intensive work for them in addition to for us. So um, the, um, the Commonwealth Fund paper by uh, Clemens Hong and other people sort of goes into some of this issue of how to select patients any of you have any questions about selecting patients or any any um, any sort of pearls that you've learned about how to select patients for complex care management? Well, a pearl, uh, maybe not so much, but um, we use our uh, discharge logs from um, a urgent care ER inpatient same-day surgery kind of reference um, and transitions of care obviously are priorities um, as well as those that you've pointed out have you know multiple comorbids polypharmacy etc um, I found it interesting you, you were talking about the fact that they don't want to leave case management um, we had a handoff to disease management 
which was uh, a paraprofessional then um, assisting uh, the patient or the member <laughs> it was in the insurance company um, to deal with their their chronic illness once a plan of care has been well established and then they just handhold if you will um, and so the handoff was better received in that in that case um, interestingly enough Okay, thank you for that. I have, I have a question about the social isolation that you had listed. Do you have a yes. recommendation of how you would screen for that, or how how did you mine that barrier? Or is it just more uh, of an that's anecdotal? There are screening tools for it, which I'm not yeah. that familiar with. But generally, mm -hmm. your team will, will know it. So if you have an elderly patient who's living by themselves, right. it doesn't have So it's just more of an anecdotal. Okay, okay. Yeah. I think I think okay. mainly I think you'll know it when you see it. Um, yeah, so Mercy has that. identified community health workers as part of the care management team as well, and their their um, primary care uh, medical home uh, oriented, um, and the 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 patients are identified at office visits often. Those disheveled, you know, people who have kind of identified self-care deficits um, yeah. are identified often as those that are socially isolated or lack social okay. support at any rate. Yeah. Okay, so what do we do when we do complex care management? So generally speaking, the teams that I'm familiar with um, assess what the patient needs, usually develop a care plan. The care plan ideally is also made with the patient and family. Um, Care plans really are often a list of what the problems are, and then for each problem, you figure out, like, what are you going to do about it? The team teaches the patient and family about their diseases and their symptoms and uses health coaching techniques, so closing the loop, making sure people understand if there's a change in medication or if there's a suggested change in behavior, ask them to say it back, so make sure they understand it. Knowing your numbers, medication adherence, counseling, and action plans is really important for complex care management. But also, we really spend a lot of time, you know, we have a health coaching curriculum, but we also have a complex care management curriculum. And one of the key differences between, say, someone with diabetes only and someone with, uh, you know, hypertension, congestive heart failure, COPD, uh, all of these different things is, Yellow and red flags are very, very crucial. So teaching the patient and family um, what are the signs that you might be kind of going over the cliff with your chronic disease and you might need to be hospitalized to go to the ED, making sure they see those things early and can do something about them. So that's a very key part of complex care management. Just for a few minutes about payment. Um, we all know that fee-for-service does not help um, team-based care. Um, so there are fee-for-service add-ons. There are um, um, patient-centered medical home payments in addition to your fee-for-service and also pay for performance that can help um, pay for a complex care management team. And of course, we're all, a lot of us, hoping for alternative payment models, whether it be risk-adjusted capitation, the global budget, or shared savings from reducing hospitalizations in an ACO that would be helpful for paying for a complex care management team. Um, and of course, there's Medicare's new care management fee. Do any of you use the, the 99490 new CPT code? So this came in with Medicare, I think the beginning about a year ago. And um, it, it, will, it's, it is a fee-for-service code. Uh, it pays for patients who have two or more chronic conditions that increase the risk of death, exacerbation, and functional decline. You have to have a care plan. The provider and team has to be accessible 24-7, which is, of course, not an easy thing to do in most primary care practices. This new care management fee, to get the, the payment, takes a lot of work. Um, the fee is only about $45 once a month, which is very little. So what people have figured out is that the complex care manager, to make it worthwhile to start billing using this fee, you have to have 100 patients that the complex care manager is seeing 
and interacting with each month, and it can be telephonic. And in that case, you get $54,000, which is maybe enough to pay for a complex care manager, but in California, it sure isn't anywhere near enough. So, <laughs> Bite your tongue. <laughs> but this new fee is very nice. Thank you, Medicare, but most practices find that the amount of work is greater than the amount of payment and don't use it. Oh, yeah. So, worth knowing about, but maybe not worth trying to do. So, let's go into some models. There are many different complex care management models. And if you look at two um, reports that I co uh, authored with, um, one of them is more about uh, Medicare uh, patients, which is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation report, and the Center for Healthcare Strategies report is more about Medicaid patients, and they're very, very different. Because Medicaid patients tend to be more, have mental health problems, often substance abuse, maybe homelessness, plus maybe COPD and some other, you know, um, physical diseases. The Medicare patients tend to be more the physical diseases and less the mental health issues. So the Medicaid patients are, in a way, much more difficult to deal with. So what are some of the models? Well, there's the health plan model, which is often telephonic. Um, there's the hospital discharge model, primary care. We're going to go into a few of these in more detail. Primary care model, the, A the AICU model, emergency department, home care. Now, housing first model is you have a, a homeless or precariously housed patient. Don't, just don't. Don't deal with the medical stuff. Try to get them housed first. If you get these people housed, um, they will do better. Their costs will go down. Um, all the medical stuff won't work if they're homeless. So let's just look at some of these models, um, and I'm sure some of you are using some of these models. So the health plan model, the traditional health plan model is a care manager that sits in somewhere in the health plan building and calls up people that they've never met. This model does not work very well. I don't know the extent to which this model exists in in Michigan where you all of you are working. Does it? Not so much? Yes. Yeah, not so much. Yeah, not so much. But, but, for you, because this model doesn't work. But there are there is there are health plan models that do work that are very different. And Care Oregon's Medicaid Managed Care Plan has a, a wonderful, wonderful um, model of complex care management. And they have people who are non licensed people. Well no, actually some of them are licensed and some of them are not. They call them health resilience specialists. They're hired by the health plan, but they actually work in the primary care practices where the health plan's patients are uh, getting their care. Most of the patients have physical disease, mental illness, and often addiction. The patients are not just seen telephonically, but they're seen in clinic, at home, in community settings. The health resilience specialist will accompany them to specialists and community referral visits. Um, and they really build trust with the patients. They help them navigate. They do motivational interviewing to make sure that the patients are uh, working with their, their goals that they have. They do health literacy education, uh, health coaching, and they're supervised by RN behaviorists and pharmacists. And I've gone to actually one of their weekly meetings where all of the health resilience specialists from all the different primary care sites come together and they discuss their difficult patient, patients. And it's really inspiring to see how the wonderful work that they're doing for these very, very difficult patients. So the health plan model can really work if it goes beyond the, the typical um, sort of care manager on the telephone. Hospital discharge model, there's several different models. There's the Marriott Naylor's model, there's the Eric Coleman model. This is the Eric Coleman model, which I like a lot because it's relatively low intensity and low cost. So they train RNs as what they call transition coaches. So they really have five interactions with the patient, only five, that's it. First, they see the patient in the hospital. Second, they see the patient in the home shortly after discharge. And then there are three post-discharge phone calls. And the reason that it works is that they do health coaching. So rather than say, this is what you need to do for your congestive heart failure, when they do their home visit, 
they really teach the patient and the family the, the, the yellow and the red flags. So if you if you start having more trouble breathing, if your ankles swell up, if you begin to gain some weight, these are the different things you can do to to avoid further um, re, re, uh, readmission hospitalization. And they had significantly lower readmission um, rates and lower hospital costs compared to controls. So the, really the key is if you have a discharge planner in the hospital and then another person who is more in the primary care or the home setting, it doesn't work nearly as well as if you have the same person in the hospital also doing some of the post-hospital work. It seems to work better. But there are, are many different models, and I think a lot of us are very interested in the care transitions uh, care management model because of the need to reduce hospital readmission. I'm sure you're doing some of that in Michigan. The primary care model is really doing complex care management right there in the primary care practice. And one good example of this is the GRACE program, which is um, pioneered by Steve Council at the University of Indiana School of Medicine. They, it's a pretty expensive model. The nurse practitioner, social worker, care management team uh, working with primary care physicians and a geriatrician. And what they found is that they can reduce hospitalizations and actually reduce total costs. And they have very small caseloads, as we've talked about before. Now, this is the AICU, or Ambulatory Intensive Caring Unit, which is, I think, a ridiculous term, but it's out there. Have any of you heard of the AICU model? Well, you're going to hear no. about it now. Um, so this is complex patients cared for by a separate high-risk clinic with a team of a physician, RN, social worker, perhaps pharmacist, health coaches. So rather than the person being taken care of in primary care by their primary care provider, these patients are taken away from their primary care provider if they have one and taken care of by a particular separate high-risk clinic, and that's called the Ambulatory Intensive Care Unit. If the patients have a PCP, they leave their PCP, or they stay with their PCP, but they also come to this separate clinic for high-risk patients. And most of them like the separate clinic because they get such wonderful care from the nurses and social workers and other people in the clinic that they often will leave their primary care physician. Because in, in the 15 or 20-minute visit, the primary care physician cannot take care of someone with complex care needed. Not, not happening. And often the primary care physicians like the fact that these complex patients leave them because they're not doing a good job with the patients and the patients take a lot of time. Now, maybe there's not a separate clinic for these high-risk patients, but it's actually a separate team in the primary care practice. So, so we have, for example, in one of our practices at San Francisco General, we have a high-risk team, complex care management team. And the, the primary care physicians will refer patients and they will accept these patients, and then those, they're taken care of by this team. And they, they, so far, the data shows that they're doing a lot better in terms of reducing their hospitalizations and improving their care. And that team has a nurse, social worker, pharmacist, and a health coach to take care of these patients. So another way to do it is what they call an AICU hybrid. So the patient can choose if they want to continue to be taken care of by the primary care provider, then, they, then the, the, there's also an RN-led complex care management team, like a sort of a, this is like the primary care model, or the patient could leave the primary care provider and go to a separate clinic or go to a separate team, which just takes care of a small number of complex patients. Unfortunately, so far, there's not a lot of good research to show whether people being in the more primary care model or being in the AICU separate high-risk team or high-risk clinic model, which one works better. Um, but here's an example at Stanford um, in, uh, here in California. Stanford has a, a hybrid model, which is called Stanford Coordinated Care. So this is a separate clinic, it's only for complex patients. There are four physicians, um, a couple of RNs, um, three 
uh, what they call care coordinators, who are basically medical assistants with much greater training, who do the health coaching and the navigation work. They have a pharmacist, physical therapist, and patients um, or high-cost, high complex patients get referred to this clinic, and they can decide if they want to stay with their primary care physician and just be seen by the clinic sort of for extra uh, care, or if they want to actually stay with, leave their primary care physician and just be taken care of in the clinic. And almost all the patients leave their primary care physician because this clinic does unbelievable, wonderful work with the patients. In fact, I was just visiting it uh, last week, uh, went to their, um, their meeting of their team. And this is a team that is really very inspiring in terms of how wonderfully they take care of their patients. So this is, again, AICU model, but patients can stay with their primary care physician if they want. They look at multiple clinical measures, um, not just clinical, but also functional activities of daily living and other things, utilization, of course, ED, hospital admits, and patient experience. And they have this big wall, which has red, yellow, and green for each one of these different measures for each of the patients. Of course, what they're trying to do is to get the red out, to bring people into the green zone. And they really work hard on, on patients who are still have, they're in the red zone for whether it be hemoglobin A1C or continuing to go to the ED too much and so forth. The early data shows that their ED visits have gone down by 39%. The hospital admits have gone down by 25%. The patients love the place and their heat is quality measures are, are like at the very top of the national scale. Do any of you have um, a, a high-risk team or a high-risk clinic that, that your, your complex patients go to? It's not common in Please. the United States, but it's beginning to be used. Yes, could you have something to say? Um, this is Lana from Spectrum. I, I, I'm thinking about um, the Integrative for Center for Integrative Medicine. We do have a specialized clinic there. Um, and their focus is um, for patients that are struggling with addiction, um, but also chronic pain and high utilizations of the ER and hospitalization. Mental health issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and do, those, do those patients get all their care there, or do they also have a primary care practice? Um, most of their care is there. A lot of times they do keep their primary care um, physician, and there's kind of an agreement that they work together and that doctor takes over at the Center for Integrative Medicine, and then they would bring them back to primary care okay. when they're stabilized. Yeah. So it's, that, that's, it's not, it used I, to be I, more hard fast, and they changed the model a little bit. I, I think that's a really good model myself. I, I, Having been in primary care for so long, I know given what the day is like, we just can't take care of these these, these patients with complex illnesses. Mm -hmm. We need mm -hmm. RN, social workers, addiction people, health coaches, navigators, and so forth. And we need people who have more time. And that means that they have to have a smaller caseload because if you have a thousand patients, you just don't have the time and you never will to really do a good job with those patients. And that's why those of you who are care managers are so critical for the care of these patients. Okay, so what works the best among all of these programs? And again, this is not this is not a scientific a thing that it looks like from some of the evidence that's beginning to accumulate is that health coaching is really important for these complex patients, teaching the patients, families, and caregivers how to self-manage their conditions. And health coaching for complex patients is both similar and different from health coaching for someone who just has diabetes or hypertension. But if you take a, a, the, the problems of a complex patient, you can divide those the totality of that patient into very particular issues. And usually each issue that the patient has is not so complicated. It's the interaction of all of them that's so complicated. 
if you do a care plan and an action plan for each of the separate problems, you can actually get a handle on it. And that's why creating a care plan, really working um, working down the different problems in the a, a rel relative order that you and the patient and the family decide on, really works pretty well. So you really can take complexity and make it into um, a lot of different less complex issues. And that's what a good care plan will do. Um, and again, just back to the whole issue of Medicare versus Medicaid. Um, in general, Medicaid patients are way more complex and their problems are more difficult to actually make a dent with um, because of the mental health issues, the addiction issues, and sometimes the homelessness issues. And those are the patients at San Francisco General Hospital that we're dealing with. And, and it's, it's very difficult to make a dent, and we're, we don't know yet whether our complex care management team is making a dent yet because we really feel like we need to collect data for three or four years to really see if it make, makes a difference. One year is probably not enough. Again, health coaching for complex patients. Um, the red flags and the yellow flags are a very, very key part of it. And I assume that that's what a lot of you do as, as care managers, is really teach patients and families how to recognize when things are getting worse and then what to do if things are getting worse. Those are probably the most important parts of health coaching for uh, complex patients, is the red flags and the yellow flags. So, Coming to the end, what are the take-home messages? Population-based care has different levels. You can stratify your population. Everyone needs panel management, making sure that they have the, um, the preventive and chronic care regular things that they that everyone needs. Some people need health coaching um, if they have a chronic disease. And then a small number of people in your panel need complex care management. Of course, that's what most of you, I think, who are here today spend your time doing is working with the complex patients. Care management includes patient education, but also health coaching um, and medication management. Health coaching assists people to gain the knowledge, skills, and confidence to become informed active participants in their care. And if they're not informed active participants, probably they're not going to do that well. Health coaching is essential for people both with one or two conditions and with multiple conditions and complex health care needs. And little by little, with a lot of people trying out complex care management around the country, we're learning from experience how to take care of patients with high cost and complex health care needs. And I think that um, over the next two or three years, we're going to find that when you have a, a, a care management team or a, a care manager, um, we're going to find that healthcare costs for a lot of these patients are going to go down and that their, their, their um, life and their outcome are going to get better. So I think it's a very exciting part of, of um, healthcare at the moment, which is um, we're doing this more because we're worried about the costs, but as we worry about the costs, we're actually making life better for these patients. So thank you very much. And thank you for improving the health of the people. Thank you. So I would like to thank everyone for attending. And just a reminder, for the CME and the social work credits, we do need to have your completed evaluation. And in that evaluation, your name with the attestation. And at this time, I really, I mean, we have uh, the great uh, value of having Dr. Bodenheimer's experience and, uh, you know, his uh, knowledge uh, open it up to questions. So if you have questions, the lines are open. Oh, one question here is the PowerPoint, and yes, we will be sending that out uh, once we have the full list of attendees. So that's one question that was in the box. but. Please feel free to ask questions that you have that you want to take advantage of Dr. Bodenheimer's availability.
I have a question about in, uh, teams that have um, various members such as behavioral health, pharmacy, care management. Do you have any thoughts about um, how they manage the patient together? Do you tend to identify one person as the lead care manager and sort of coordinate the others? Because I know sometimes there's more behavioral health maybe than medical, that type of thing. Just wondering what you've seen. Um, well, of course, it's really key if, if you have a team that the team meet together and discuss the patient. Um, now, sometimes the teams are not all in the same place, but now, you know, with with the kind of, you know, virtual, you know, um, distance conferencing, you can have these conferences anywhere you want. But, so, like Project ECHO in, in New Mexico, they have Every week they have a complex care management conference where they have people from the University of New Mexico, and people from different um, primary care practices all around the state um, meeting together virtually um, to discuss uh, complex patients. Um, so the, the, the team really has to get together and meet and figure out. Uh, generally speaking, there should be someone for each patient who's the principal care manager responsible for that patient. And then it depends on what the patient's main problems are. So if the patient's main problems are kind of congestive heart failure and diabetes, probably an RN should be the main care manager for that patient. If the patient's problems are more behavioral, then probably a social worker or a behaviorist um, would be a more appropriate person to be the, the, the main sort of in charge of that patient, asking for the assistance of other people as needed. So usually it's RNs and the social workers or um, uh, behavioral health providers like psychologists, or licensed clinical social workers who are usually the main sort of care manager for patients and then working with the team for, for assistance as needed. Thank you. Other questions? Well, maybe while we're waiting for folks to collect their thoughts, Dr. Bodenheimer, do you have any um, stats or information to think about the FTEs per population? So if I have 20,000 patients, would you recommend a complex care manager? Any thoughts on the number of care managers for the population? Um, that's a question I probably can't answer, but of course, number one, if it's a population that's mainly Medicaid, so for example, if it's a federally qualified health center that mostly has Medicaid patients, you're going to need more care management because there's going to be more, um, more pathology, more, more morbidity. Number two, if you have a really elderly population, you're going to have a lot of people with complex care needs, so you really have to figure out sort of what your population is like. I don't know the answer, and I'm not. I'm probably someone knows the answer, but I'm not sure what the answer is. Thank you. Appreciate that. I think a lot of times what happens is it really depends on how much money that the that the, the health plan or the the uh, health system has to pay for for care managers. And of course, imagine that one can always use more than you actually get the budget for. And in your experience, have you identified where health plans are starting to have reimbursement for uh, staff such as community health workers, the non-licensed individuals? Any well, experience with that? Very, very little. It's really discouraging that um, a lot, I don't understand why health plans don't step up to the plate to, to fund these things because they could save a lot of money to do it. Um, I, th I think it's going to be coming. Um, we don't really know what the other H ACOs are really going to work and whether they're going to catch on. Um, of course, ACOs um, have the um, incentive to try to reduce hospitalizations and reduce costs, so you'd think that they'd want to invest in complex care management teams to help them to actually um, 
reduce those costs, I think we, we really have to see. Uh, now, we, of course, have Kaiser Health Plan here in California and other places in the country, which is a health plan that's globally budgeted, so it's in their interest to the health plan and the, and the provider organization. They're kind of almost like the same organization, so it's in their interest to keep costs down, so they do have contact care management teams. Um, but, we, we, you know, we need health plans like CARE Oregon and, and Oregon to really step up to the plate and say, okay, we can save money by funding these complex care management teams, so we really should do it. And we just need more of it than, than we're actually seeing right now. Well, we are at the time. Um, I'll give one more opportunity if there's one more question. Hearing none, I thank everyone for attending and special thanks to you, Dr. Bodenheimer. And just a reminder to send in your evaluation and uh, stay in touch. So thank you, and again, many thanks, Dr. Bodenheimer. Really appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you.